Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Great, thanks. Well, I think this is a great time to talk about the new FDA-approved cabotegavir plus rilpivirine extended release injectable suspension. This has the trade name Cabinuva. What I'm going to try and do is take you through the logistics of administering this medication, which is now FDA-approved only for treatment, not for PrEP at this point. So I will focus only on treatment. So what is the official FDA approval for this? This is now FDA approved as a replacement antiretroviral therapy for persons who have documented viral loads that are less than 50 copies per ml. Individuals receiving this should be on a stable antiretroviral regimen. They should not have a history of treatment failure. Well, I think some of that can be negotiable if it was a specific class of drug. And they should not have known or suspected resistance to cabotegravir or to rilpivirine or cross-resistance to those drugs. In addition, even though it's not a formal part of the indication, I think all of us would acknowledge that we shouldn't be using this drug as sole therapy for an individual who has chronic active hepatitis B. So if you are not that familiar with it, let me just give you a sense that actually administering this will require an oral lead-in with a new oral cabotegravir. Just to clarify, the new oral cabotegravir at this time is only FDA approved as part of this overall regimen for the injectable preparations. So there's the oral lead-in that's a combination of cabotegravir and the oral drug rilpivirine. And then there's the injection, which is a, a loading dose and a monthly dose, and I'll go through the logistics of that. And essentially, when you're doing the injection in the clinic, people be administering um, different total mills, either two mills or three mills. Also to clarify, this is not in a combined syringe. There's a separate cabotegravir syringe and a separate rilpivirine syringe and separate bottles, as I've shown in this illustration. So logistically, how do you do this? So there is the oral lead-in, which should approximately be for 28 days. And again, this is going to be with once daily cabotegravir and rilpivirine. These should be taken with food. And then there's the first injection. We call that the initiation injection. And again, that's a larger dose. So just to clarify, the first dose is three milliliters of each of the cabotegravir and rilpivirine. And you can see that is equivalent to 600 milligrams of cabotegravir, 900 milligrams. And then there's what we call continuation injections or monthly injections, which is two milliliters of each of those. And then you can see, again, a smaller amount on the monthly injections, 400 and 600. The injection should actually be given at opposite gluteal sites, or if you have to give it at the same gluteal site, it should be at least two centimeters apart. So on the, the a visit when you're giving these injections, ideally at the opposite. For those of you that are more visually oriented, this is really what this looks like. There's the oral lead-in for a month, and then there's that initial initiation injection. Notice the syringe is filled higher. There's a higher amount, and then there are the continuation injections that are given on a monthly basis. There's nothing magic about what time of the month it needs to be start, but the doses really should be given on a regular basis, uh, on a monthly basis once, and it can be given indefinitely. So what about the data for this? So the study that got this primarily FDA approved is the ATLAS study. So I'm going to talk about two studies that really, I, I think, give us a sense for treatment experience patients, which is really the way that the FDA approval is laid out. But then I'm going to briefly mention the FLARE study as a third study, which is basically giving the cabrilpivirine up front, really, and not in people who have long-established undetectable viral loads, but more after an initial antiretroviral regimen. So let's begin by the ATLAS study, and this is really the most important study to understand extrapolating to the FDA approval and extrapolating to what you'd be doing in clinical practice. Without going into a lot of details, I will outline the design, which essentially this was a large phase three trial. They're looking at this IM cabotegravir rilpivirine in adults on stable antiretroviral therapy with suppressed viral loads. So they, they could have 
been taking a NNRTI-based regimen, a PI regimen, an integrase-based regimen. They just have to have stable antiretroviral therapy for at least six months and undetectable viral load for at least six months. They were not allowed to have chronic hepatitis B in this study. To your right, you can see the layout of this, which is just what I was describing a minute ago. The oral lead in for four weeks, then they're followed by the, this actually essentially the initial injection and then the monthly injections. And then this was compared, the IM cab was compared to just continuing on the regimen that they were on. So this was a randomized trial where they looked at this. In essence, what they got, if you look at the graph here, was in terms of percentage of individuals who had an undetectable viral load at 48 weeks after the randomization, you can see that they were very similar. The cab ropivirine, 92.5%. The three-drug oral regimen, 955 And again, this is really what predominantly got the, the drug FDA approved. And I think the factor we look at probably the most is virologic failure. So the difference in the two regimens was 1.6% failure with cab ropivirine, 1.0 with the three-drug oral. So very similar. Now, what about Atlas 2M? This is not directly relevant to what we're doing now, but is highly relevant, what you're likely to see perhaps within six months. So right now, the cabrolpivirine is FDA approved only for monthly injections. This study, the Atlas 2M, is looking at it giving every two months. And this is what to look for in the next six months for an additional FDA approval. So basically what they're looking in this particular study is looking at the oral cab lead-in the, the oral ropivirine cab lead-in followed by either every eight-week injections or every four-week injections. So this is really looking at can you stretch this out and would it look just as good with every four weeks as every eight weeks? And again, these were individuals who had been on antiretroviral therapy, stable with a viral load undetectable for six months. We're, but as opposed to just continuing them on therapy, they're really extrapolating now to let's switch everybody but look at every four weeks or every eight weeks. And this is essentially what you got. Very high sustained, uh, keeping viral load on less than 50 copies and very similar results with every eight weeks versus every four weeks. So because this data looks so good, look out for potential additional FDA approval where cabrolpivirine may be able to be given every eight weeks in the future. But right now, it's only every four weeks, and the dosing will be different for this. So don't mix this up at this time. Keep with the every four weeks at present because that's what's FDA approved. The last one to mention is the FLARE study. And I only mention this because this could replicate more a situation you may have where somebody is more newly diagnosed, and you look at the situation right up front and go, this person really would be a good candidate for IM therapy up front. So the FLARE study looked at, as opposed to people long-term on antiretroviral therapy, what about initiating with a month of dolutegavir, abacavir, lamivudine, and then right after that, and actually it was a 16 weeks, I should say it was a, a month that was 16 weeks, and then right after that initial sort of induction with oral therapy, then looking to see could you make this switch to the IM cabotegravir every four weeks. So in the FLARE study, when they did this, and they, they had to have a documented viral load less than 50 copies at the week 16 when they made this switch. So again, this is a little bit different because this is sort of planning it up front that you may be going to a cabrolpivirine regimen. And again, a very good success with the IM cabrolpivirine with 93.6% versus 93.3% in the individuals that sustained on the oral regimen. So now let's look at briefly the big issue with adverse effects. Very safe administration, very uh, in terms of major serious side effects, but clearly where it's at in terms of side effects is the what's called the injection site reactions. And, and this is a study from the FLARE trial in the New England Journal, and it really just illustrates that you tend to get more of these in the first couple injections. People tend to get a lot of reactions, but then as time goes on, they tend to settle out with about 20% of people getting these injection site reactions. Otherwise, it's very well tolerated. What about resistance? This is really important because we're dealing with an integrase inhibitor. We're dealing with a long-acting drug. We're dealing with issues that if somebody comes off of it and they have this long tail of the drug, what could happen with resistance? We don't know a lot. 
But if you look at the three studies and you just kind of pull it together and say, what do we know from resistance? In these studies, overall, there was 1.2% of individuals taking a cab pivoting based regimen who had virologic failures. That's seven out of 591 participants. Five of the seven who had this virologic failure had a subtype called A1, and it had this baseline, what's called the L74I polymorphic accessory mutation. And two of the seven had this subtype AG without this, uh, the L74I mutation. And for those of you that know a little bit about the subtypes, this A1 subtype and AG subtype are very uncommon in the U.S., but they're very high proportion in areas like Russia. So six of the seven participants had this Russian subtype, the AA1 or AG. And, and again, these are high proportion when you look at HIV subtypes in Russia, but very uncommon in the U.S. And if you're familiar with the subtypes in the U.S., we're predominantly B dominant in the U.S. Now, in terms of anything worrisome, two of the seven who had virologic failure developed this Q148R mutation. That is a highly significant integrase mutation that leads to potential significant cross-resistance in the class. One developed this N155H, again, a highly significant mutation. So that was the reason that I highlighted those in red, because those are highly significant. So what I want to close with the last couple minutes is a couple practical issues that may come up if you are indeed using this cabotegravir ropivirine intramuscular injection in the clinic setting. So a question comes up, what about the timing of the flexibility? So what if a person is supposed to be on a monthly schedule and they show up three days early for their injection? Or what if they're five days late for the injection? What do you do? So here's what the recommendations are. That's actually really straightforward. There's clear recommendation that patients may receive the cabin ropivirine injections up to seven days before or after the date of the scheduled monthly injection. So it's nice that that's in the FDA approval, that there's some real flexibility in a clinic setting when these type of issues are going to come up all the time. And certainly, you know, they could fall on a weekend that a person's supposed to come in if you're mapping it out exactly 28 days. So it's nice that there's this flexibility. What about this situation? What if they're planning to go out of the country? You know, they're scheduled to come in the clinic, they get a chance to go or their business, for whatever reason or pleasure, they're deciding that they're going to be out of the country for several months, for maybe a month or two. What are you going to do if they're planning to miss at least one month of the injection? So there's clear recommendation. So what you can do is you can take oral therapy just like you did in the lead-in, the once daily cab 30 milligrams, once daily ropivirine, 25 milligrams. That can be done to replace up to two consecutive injections. So if somebody says they're going to be out of the country for six months and they're coming back, this is not the right option. They need to switch to a standard oral regimen. But if they're going to be gone for up to two months, you can get by with the so-called bridge therapy or oral therapy. So you start the oral therapy. Let's say they're supposed to get their injection on February 10th and they're leaving the country February 3rd. They have their prescription with them. On February 10th, when they were supposed to get their next injection, they start taking the pills. And they continue on that till they get back to the clinic and get their next injection. But again, it, the oral therapy is continued until the next injection, but you really should only be doing the bridge therapy up to two months. This is just a little bit of a visual of this. So, you know, you use your oral lead-in, you use the high dose initially, you got them on the monthly injection, but then there's a planned gap that they have. If you have a planned gap, you write your prescription, oral bridge therapy, restart as soon as they come back, get them back on track. And then again, the oral bridge is allowed for up to two months. And if you're going to exceed that, then you need to plan in advance and transition them to another regimen such as, you know, BIC TAF FTC or Dolutegavir TAF FTC or some equivalent type regimen. Dolutegavir Rilpivirine would be also a very good substitute that you could do that would be very close to this in terms of overall efficacy and similarity. What about if they drop out of care? What do you do? I mean, this is a big issue. If they're going to be dropping out of care, not for a week, but they're going to miss at least one injection, 
What do we do as clinicians? So here's the recommendations and the prescribing information. And everything that I'm telling you is what's in the recommended prescribing information. So I'm, I'm not making this up just on my own bias. I'm trying to give you what's the standard recommendations and the prescribing information, which I think are very sound, actually. So if they're going to miss at least a month and seven days, because remember, you can take that dose if you're up to seven days late. If oral therapy has not been taken, in other words, it wasn't planned, they're just out of care, what do you do? Well, you got to reassess. If they've jumped, if they've fallen out of care, you've got to step back and say, is this the right plan? Is this really the right client? If it's becoming difficult to be able to come in on a regular basis for injections, maybe this is not the strategy that is going to give you the highest chance of success. If since the, the time since they've been gone has been less than two months, then the recommendation is, let's say they just miss six weeks, they're out of care, but then they come in. So they miss more than that seven days, but they're only off by seven weeks total. In that case, if it's less than two months, you go back to the standard monthly injection, that two milliliters of the real piverine, two millimeters of the cabotegravir. However, if they're out for like, you know, three or four months, they're out completely, then what you need to do, again, seriously reassess if this is the right situation, and then resume just like you did at the beginning, not with the oral lead-in, but the higher dose initially, the three milliliters, and then you go to the standard monthly dosing after that. So I think probably everyone understands, but just to clarify the purpose of the oral lead-in is not necessarily to get them undetectable. The purpose of the oral lead-in is to make sure that they don't have an adverse reaction to cabotegravir or real pivoting because you're going to be putting something long-acting in their system and you want to make sure that they do not have an allergic reaction to that. Now, why it needs to be for a full month and it's not a week or two weeks is not entirely clear to me except for I think that's the way that that was set out at the very beginning. So, I'll just wrap it up there, and Brian, I'll turn it back to you and and open it up for questions. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.